Welcome to Folkways, an auditory stroll through the rich and fascinating folklore of Britain and Ireland. The beliefs and culture of people who made this cluster of northerly islands their home. From music to psychogeography, to what to do if you notice the devil following you to church. It's a long, strange trip, and there are no guarantees you'll be home in time for dinner. Welcome to our fourth episode, where we're finding out that still water runs deep as we get out our hiking boots and head up high into the mountains for one of my favourite pieces of folklore, the water women of the Welsh lakes. Enjoy. When we say Lady of the Lake, there might be one particular figure that springs to mind first. And even as I just said those words, Lady of the Lake, I imagined this enrobed arm bursting out of a lake holding the bejeweled sword of Excalibur. And maybe you had something similar. It's interesting that the Lady of the Lake is a name used by several fairy-like enchantresses, and they're found in the body of medieval literature and mythology, associated of course with the legend of King Arthur. She or they play pivotal roles in many of the stories including providing Arthur with the aforementioned Excalibur, eliminating mega-wizard Merlin, raising Lancelot after the death of his father, and helping to take the dying Arthur to Avalon. And whilst this aquatic maiden has been known by many names, most common are Nimoy or Vivian. And we note she's been an inspiration to many artists over the centuries, from the 1810 poem The Lady of the Lake by Walter Scott, offering a retelling of her myth set in a Scottish lake, to a brief appearance in the 1981 John Borman film Excalibur, in a somewhat dreamy sequence, and as an arm that reaches up from the water to reclaim the sword when Arthur dies. But most interesting, perhaps, is that this figure seems to be based on older Celtic goddesses associated with water. There's a vast array of celebrated water spirits, and most of them we find are women. Who springs to mind first might be Curridwen, the goddess who possessed that magic kettle or cauldron, and in this she brewed herbs and water that would grant next level wisdom to whoever stood still a moment to drink it. Even more notably is Brigid, or Breed, Brige, or Brigid, a goddess who kept watch over a well, from which a prospective king had to drink in order to earn his place on the throne, an initiation of types. But as well as these more familiar figures, there's also a plethora of stories regarding people who actually had relations with watery women, and none so more than in Wales, where this theme forms a substantial vein of oral and written tradition. In Welsh, the Gurgith Anun, or Wives of the Lower World or Hell, are the names for the dames who dwell under the water in Welsh belief. They're not mermaids, rather their haunt is the lakes and rivers, but especially the wild and lonely lakes upon the mountain heights, remote, situated on the edge of human society. As W. Sykes notes in his indispensable survey of rural Welsh belief, these romantic sheets are surrounded with numberless stories, primarily they're serving as avenues of communication between this world and the lower one of Anun, a shadowy realm, one presided over by Gwynap Neath, king of the fairies. This subaqueous realm is peopled by those known as Plant Anun, or family of the other world, and the belief can still sometimes be found among the inhabitants of the Welsh mountains that this other world family still occasionally visit this upper world of ours. <laughs> 
This is one of the most famous stories of these visits involving a young man and what he saw coming out of one of these lakes one day and how his life was never the same again. As people remarked later, a boy was born in Blind Souther on the day the first spring flowers opened their petals in the mountains. When he became old enough, he was given the job of tending the sheep and cattle that grazed upon the Black Mountain by the lake named Thinny Van Vogt. As well as being a good worker, the job suited his disposition, and he was quite content to work alone, untroubled by the solitude and the harsh mountain wind, and days seemed to rattle right through him to his bones. It wasn't a job for everybody, and the constant exposure to the sometimes punishing elements made his young body grow hardy quickly, but his eyes never changed, the image of the lake sometimes reflected back in them. An initial dreaminess of his youth matured into a certain pensive nature, and he learnt by being very still, you often saw things that others might miss. He would spend many long hours gazing into the waters of the lake. He became as familiar a piece of the scenery as the crags on the mountains themselves. He learnt every sweeping twist or knoll of the landscape intimately, in the same way he knew the face of his mother. With an unrivalled attention to detail, he still remained as good and reliable a worker as ever, and years went by without, seemingly, much change to this daily routine. Near the end of September, he left his day's work at roughly the same time he did each day, and, with a pang of hunger, made his way back down by the river to Blind Souther. Though all looked as it should, he noticed something slightly different in the air, a certain electricity. His eyes scanned the autumnal path to his home, and he brought his shoulders up instinctively as a couple of burnt orange leaves grazed his shoulders. This feeling was quickly forgotten once back in the warmth of his mother's house. Even though it had been three years now, a part of her had been lost at the death of his father and though she remained upbeat and worked hard, she sometimes spoke in strange riddles, or left off the beginning or end of sentences, so just a few fractured words hung in the air behind her, as she darted off elsewhere. This untidiness of mind had begun to concern Huathlon, since his mother was still so young, and it didn't bode well for the future. Strangest of all, though, was the bread. Sometimes, she eagerly pressed little more than raw dough into his hands for him to take to work, as she warmly waved him goodbye. She had a proud streak, and would not take news of the decline in her bread-making well. Loaves that had been, she would remind you, prized amongst the neighbours. She looked downright offended when he offered to make some bread himself. In her shocked face, he sensed, at least, there was some kind of a subtext here that he was only getting the edges of. After stewing over the doughy issue one evening by the fire, he thought he might get around it by staying up late as he gazed into the flames, his cheeks burning, before quietly walking to the kitchen to make his own dough. He had scarcely started when she emerged silently in the doorway, causing Rathlon to yell in fright, a look on her face one that genuinely scared him, catching a prickle of tears then in her left eye as she turned away. That had been worse than uncooked bread for lunch, so he settled on waking earlier each morning to back extra cheese and anything else to bulk out his lunch for the day ahead. On the morning of September the 27th, Huathlon woke before sunrise and headed out the front door for his day on the mountains. As was custom, he stood by the gate to watch the sun break the horizon. He found being there for the first light piercing the gloom an indescribably satisfying ritual. 
As a teenager, he had held his breath whilst he did this, his lungs screaming for air, beginning to burn, as his body stood completely stiff for sometimes a minute. But that, he thought, now he'd reached the grand age of 21, was kid stuff. He followed the river as he made his daily, nearly an hour-long trek up into the mountains. The sky broke into a rare, clear blue. He forgot it was the end of September and stood for a moment to admire the view below, the waters of Thunny Van Vogt sparkling. He became transfixed by the movements of a red kite that was hunting an unsuspecting critter below. He watched the bird catching waves of the wind rising and falling, seemingly passive, yet with tension and focus like no other. As he watched, he thought he saw a sudden movement in the lake below, and his eyes darted down. There was nothing there but a large ripple that appeared to have originated from somewhere near the centre. He watched the disturbed water hitting the shore before turning his back to check on the cattle, one of which had started to make a strange sound. At long last, he made his way down to the edge of the lake and, ravenous, unwrapped his lunch. He grimaced at the sensation of rock-hard bread in his hand and held it up to the sun to view it sourly. He banged it against one of his front teeth and found it as hard as the stones at the lake's edge. Instead, opting for the cheese and slice of salt-cured meat he'd made sure to bring. He ate, then laid back in the sun, taking advantage of what would likely be the last warm day of the year. Though the scene looked idyllic against that blue sky, he full well knew how bleak the mountains could quickly become. You took advantage of every blue sky day you could in these parts. He shut his eyes and thought about what he might pack for tomorrow's lunch. His eyelids flickered against the brightness of the sun and he allowed it to warm his face and stretched palms as he listened to the distant sound of the cattle and sheep. Gradually, he identified a new sound. He heard the lapping of the lake shore near to his feet. He slowly opened his eyes which felt nearly glued together in the afternoon sunshine. He felt a jolt in his stomach as he realised there was somebody there. Somebody was in the lake. He opened his eyes wide to see a young woman bobbing close to the lake centre, not swimming, but rather seeming to be using the lake's surface as a kind of mirror as she raked a gnarled-looking comb through her long, tangled hair. He had never seen this colour hair before, but which he was later told was called Auburn. Huathlon scrambled up to his feet, feeling awkward and voyeuristic just lying there. The woman turned around, looking startled to see him as their eyes momentarily pricked together. He thought her surprise strange, since she would surely have walked past him to get to the lake in the first place. He suddenly found he didn't know what to do with his hands, and his voice wouldn't make a sound, despite how much he wanted to call out to her. He wanted to say he hadn't been staring at her, but had just been napping, but he couldn't say the words, and so he continued to stare, his throat all at once dry, tight and restricted, as if, He'd never said a word in his life. The young woman appeared to quickly get over her initial shock as she now steadily continued her work, detangling the knots in her hair. Luathlon, still unable to speak, instead walked towards the water's edge and held out all he had left from his lunch in some kind of a strange offering, the hard-baked bread. Later, he would curse himself for this, unsure why he would offer something that had not been good enough for himself to somebody else. But in the moment, with his voice failed, it was all that he had.
Seeing in the distance that he had something in his hands for her, the young woman swam to the edge of the lake and cautiously climbed out, keeping one foot tied with a strange leather shoe firmly in the water. She looked at him, their eyes meeting for the second time in a way that made Yuathlon feel like his stomach had dropped out. He had never seen anybody like her. There were beautiful girls in the village, but he knew without needing to be told that this person wasn't like them. She had on a light-coloured shift that didn't look particularly practical for a day swimming on the lake, he noticed, as she reached out a wet arm to take the bread. Huathlon held his breath, not sure if he was still alive, as the weight of the bread left his palm and passed to her. Your bread is hard-baked. No, I will not have you. Seeing his surprised face and not sure if he had understood, she repeated the same words again. She then threw the bread down, turning her back on him to walk back into the lake. Each cell in his body felt like it wanted to scream for her to stay, but he, paralysed, watched her swim out away from him and, at last, her vanish under the water. He remained where he was for a long time, waiting for the head that would need to break the water for air, but it never came, and he forgot the time and himself and sat at the lake until nearly dusk. Huathlon reached his mother's house in the dark to the sound of owls beginning to hunt, and as soon as he was through the door, the voice that had betrayed him earlier, all at once, came back. He fell to a chair and told his mother all that had happened. The words were so many they got tangled in his throat, and he spoke at length without pausing, sometimes without air, so his face began to turn a strange colour. His mother implored him to stop and eat some food with her, and only then did his words stop as he shoved buttered potatoes in his mouth that burnt his throat on the way down. His mother looked strangely unworried about the news of the vanishing woman and simply told him he'd encountered one of the many Morgans of the Welsh waterways. Uathlon had heard these stories as a child but had not paid them too much thought. He wasn't interested in rumours and tall tales, only what he could discover for himself how the formation of the rocks sometimes made faces, and how the air smelt slightly differently between morning and dusk. He battered his mother's comments away, shaking his hands at her as he told her that what had happened was no such foolishness but actually real. His mother's mouth twitched as she gave him a long look, assuring him at last she had a feeling that tomorrow's bread would be excellent. Huathlon didn't think he'd count on it as he brought in new wood from the outhouse to dry. As he picked up the remaining pieces from the yard, a bat flitted by his ear. He shuddered, startled to hear the vibrations of its wings so close to him. He stood, following its path with his eyes as it darted up by the rafters of the house before crossing the waxing crescent moon that hung like a hook in the sky. A part of him wondered if he was losing his mind. It happened to people, why was he exempt? Yet whilst he had the reflection to recognise this was a possibility, another part of him held strong. He knew what he had seen. He remembered the way the shore had began to suddenly lap at his feet, and the strange feeling in his chest as he had realised he wasn't alone. He knew what dreams were. He knew that it actually happened. What he didn't know, as he stood under the slip of the moon, was that this was only the beginning of his questions. 
Three weeks had passed since Luathlon had seen a woman walk into a lake and disappear from view. Autumn was now in full throw, and as well as his herding duties, he'd found additional farming work. Still, he found every excuse he could to visit Thinny Van Vaar and stare out at its waters. Sometimes he barely remembered the walk there, his feet on automatic, leading him to where he really wanted to be, his mind dully coming to after as it again considered the impossible situation. One late afternoon, he'd taken his work clothes off and waded into the lake. It was too late for him really to be there, knowing it would be dark soon and he still had an hour's walk home before him. Just a moment, just one moment, he told himself. He lay on his back and allowed himself to drift to the centre of the lake. It had been so cold his body had started to feel like it was burning. He drifted until he was about where he had seen her. He lay there, the smell of the water and the incoming evening intoxicating. (laughs) <laughs> he sat with his friends Ivan and Alain one night as Ivan passed Luathlon another beer. Luathlon hadn't laughed like this in a long time as they sat by the fire, his friends regaling him with tales of the man they both worked for, an uncharitable and oddly unself-aware individual whose stories about his past got more convoluted and absurd with each passing day. As Luathlon sat there, cheeks flushed from the fire, his left side with a stitch from laughing, his lips felt loose, like they could easily have told his friends what he had seen that warm afternoon in September. To this day, the only person he had told was his mother, that first evening he had returned home. It's hard to keep something to yourself. We crave the support and validation of others that we are, in fact, sane. As he sat there, with his old friends, spirits running perilously high, there was nothing he would have liked more than that validation from them. But he saw it happening in slow motion. If he told them, the initial surprise and excitement on their faces would quickly turn into slight furrowed brows as a new shadow swept in. Though it might be easily missed, he knew what that look would mean. He'd given such many times before, and mainly to his mother. Whilst his friend's words might be supportive, he knew as soon as he left the room, he would be talked about. And quickly, people in the nearby community would start to express that most terrible of things, concern for you. He saw all this ahead in an instant as the fire popped. No. He didn't think that people whispering about him was going to assist his predicament, nor bring him the answers he needed. As Ivan proceeded to fall over his own chair, Luathlon let out a howl of laughter with Alan. As his face contorted with hilarity, he knew then, for the first time, he would never tell another soul about what had happened on the 27th of September. October became November, and Luathlon was picking up even more extra farm work, slowly becoming known as a solid and trustworthy individual. But he would not give up the herding work. It was a link to his boyhood that he was keen not to sever. He was unsure who he'd be without those hours to himself. The way he felt most alive when not making small talk with others but rather soaking in the scale of the mountains in his own silence. Luathlon was lending a hand, finishing a wall at a villager's house one crisp Saturday morning in November, when he suddenly laughed to himself. As his friends yelled to each other and a weak sun at last broke through a pillow of clouds, he realised he'd really let his dreamy temperament get the better of him that time at the lake. The human mind doesn't like uncertainties. We prefer to categorise and file away to move through the world with more ease, to know what is solid and what is not. Since the incident, Luathlon's world had been unsteady, 
He had toyed with every explanation from every angle and still come up with little of worth. His mind had not stopped turning. Just to give himself some respite, he needed to know what had happened, and since he couldn't do that, he decided that it hadn't happened at all. After all, he was feeling very relaxed at the lake, in the afternoon sun with his eyes closed. For a moment, dreams and reality must have blurred. It made the most sense. Whilst his mother might talk of Morgans of the water, he wasn't going to. Laughing again, a strange feeling of freedom making his head feel light, he swung his arms and told friend and workmate Alin that the job was about done. Leaving the village and heading back in the direction of Blind Salver, instead of heading home, he then turned left and, all at once, began to run in the direction of the mountains. His feet were doing that thing again, possessed by the wings of Mercury. He continued to run upwards next to the river, his body light and agile, compelled to continue pushing upwards at speed. The November air whipped against his cheeks and made his ears hurt as the altitude continued to climb. His feet just ran upwards faster as he struggled to breathe against the wind. At last, he saw what he had come for. The lake, Thinny Van Vaux. He slowed down, now walking towards it as it appeared magnificently before him. He continued to walk closer, to it and the figure he saw there. She was back. 